Well, good morning, and thank you guys uh, for coming out today to discuss really some of the mitigation strategies uh, associated with the injectables market today. I think, you know, today and the timing that we're at with the market space itself being littered with, you know, recalls and warning letters associated with foreign particulate, with microbial contamination, and, and really what that is doing you know, to the market from a drug supply standpoint, the industry itself is at a time where we're, we're looking to advance and, and, and looking for different strategies of how do we actually mitigate the risk in aseptic manufacturing? And what are the different things that we can do to really help drive you know, a more reliable supply into the network? And one of those areas that, that we see as a tremendous uh, potential to the market space is leveraging the advanced aseptic manufacturing processing of Blowfield Seal. And really what that does and where and how it fits within the market space itself is that the Blowfield Seal technology, because we're able to automate the formation and the filling of the container itself, and we're able to offer that level of control, you're driving at the root cause of really what is occurring in the injectables market today. So when you look in, in, in the U.S. today, there has already been in 2015 19 recalls associated with particulates and 20 recalls with microbial contamination. And the fact that this technology is able to start to drive at ways of automation and control, it, it really drives at those root causes of the manufacturing challenges that are in the market space today. And that's really where and why we're excited about the advances that, that have been made with the Advicept technology of really looking at different vials, uh, lure lock type containers for ampule replacement, and where and how these things can fit because it does drive at some of those fundamental issues that are occurring in the market. So because we're able to reduce and eliminate really human intervention in your critical fill zones, you're able to you know, drive the, the sterility assurance of the product and ensure that you're, you're, you're providing a sterile product day in and day out. We're able to drastically reduce foreign particulate. Again, where and how the, the material in the container is, is formed and filled, all contained with inside the machine, your exposure to potential particulate is for a matter of about two seconds, you actually have an open vial or an open container. You're eliminating all glass management and management issues of components leading into the system, which then drastically reduces your potential for foreign particulate. And then we'll show data that actually it's not just the potential, you're really driving out particles uh, and, and the potential for foreign par particles to enter the system. Then the other ones are, are different issues around the container closure. So the process does one, but now we're able to just start to transition to a glass-free free platform. And by doing this, you're able to offer you know, very good chemical stability uh, by utilizing medical-grade polypropylene for these types of designs. And also, you're able to do things um, with reduction in weight and weight loss uh, of, of product you know, that, is, that is used within the hospital. So not only is it you know, the transportation to the hospital you're saving from a weight standpoint, but also the disposal. So you're able to gain some of the things, even just from a container closure standpoint, by leveraging this type of technology. At the end of the day, the, the BFS technology really drives that engineering control, reduction in variability, and then also where and how we understand what are the control parameters within that process. And those are the elements that truly drive out the risk associated with the aseptic manufacturing process. To just give a little highlight of what the BFS technology is, right? So all contained within this machine, we are able to form, to fill, and seal the product. And you do that all in the matter of about, you know, anywhere between 12 and 15 seconds, depending upon volume and, and you know, container formation and design. And it's this simplicity that really is one of the major drivers of how we're able to reduce variability and how we're able to mitigate the risk associated with filling of aseptic products. So ultimately, the, the, the technology converts 
raw plastic material. It gets extruded. So we have high temperatures and pressures that allow for the phase transition of the material from going to a solid into a molten plastic resin. Those are formed in what we call parasites. So those are, are tubes of plastic that come down and they enter into the, to the design of the machine. Now, where I truly believe that the innovation lies with the technology is really in this. And so 50 years ago, when the, the founders and the, and the people that you know, invented the blow field seal technology, really in that first stage, they invented what's called the two-stage processing. So what we're trying to do in this process is you're actually forming the body of the container. And in this, where you form the body of the container, you need to keep this top part molten. So that's still hot plastic resin and where and how you're balancing. But the process itself forms the body of the container and it's a very efficient heat transfer of what's taking place in the container body. So you're able to actually remove a lot of that heat associated with the container and the formation to allow for you know, really even your thermally sensitive products to be filled with in there. But you have to make sure that you maintain this balance in this step because we still need to be able to seal it. So once that body is formed, it moves forward into your filling stations. The filling nozzles come in, and really your filling zone is the, is, is the sacred ground that isn't, you know, you, you, you don't breach. So once that process and that, that system is set up, our sterile boundary isn't breached. So it's a tremendous value because we don't have that human intervention into that, you know, container formation. We fill the product. Then the, the unique part, is we're able to take and insert. So we have isolator setup that feeds into the machine and into the setup that allows for vacuum pickup tubes to, after the fill needles come up and rise, we have vacuum tubes that are able to then place inserted you know, type products. So it could be injection molded products. But really for this market space, you get different things where we're able to take and insert stoppers. So now we're able to make a vial, very similar to what you'd see on the glass side, but now we have one integral container. And that is all sealed up in really a matter of 15 seconds. So you can make anywhere from, from eight containers to even stopperless designs where you can get up to 50 containers in that 10 to 12 second cycle. So it's taken me probably two to three minutes to describe the process where I have already produced 200 units of products that have already come out of that machine. And that's really where this technology can start to leverage not only the, the manufacturing uh, efficiencies of where you can do to, to drive the automation, but think about the variability that you're able to remove from the process. So when you look at that and you really start to compare that to traditional glass filling, this is where, again, the minimization of variables, minimization of really of all of your glass management and component management that you have to take place in the upfront. So think about traditional, uh, a, a traditional vial filling line itself. Think about all of the space in the class A space that's required to clean the product, depyrogenate it, move that product through, all of that accumulation and all of that space and people that are actually in your critical application and your critical zones. Comparing that to a blow fuel seal technology where all of our class A space is actually contained within the machine. So we're really talking about really about two cubic uh, meters or, uh, of, of, of controlled space that we actually have to maintain. And that's your class A environment. It is a drastically different approach and it really drives at the variability and the minimalization and really a lot of the approach to, to, to automate and control our aseptic filling process. And again, we talked about the theory of particulate reduction. Because we don't have products, you know, we don't have containers prior to the process. So we don't have an accumulation center, we don't have an empty vial, we don't have an empty container that's fed into the machine, we actually produce the machine, you know, that we, we produce the containers as we're filling. So you can't separate the two products. And this is where we see the drastic reduction of foreign particulate. So the, the Shabushnik study and where the industry averaged was basically they were challenging 
the USP 788 testing and the limits that are in that model, uh, you know, from a, a above 10 micron and above 10, 25 micron standpoint. So they, they looked across the industry and came up with an industry average. Um, so they looked across 295 different ANDAs that were out in the market space and nearly 400 different lots of material. And they came up with an average of what those were from a particulate standpoint. We then at, at, at Catalan, we, des we designed a, a, a design of experiment that looked at all the different variables uh, within our process. And we ran uh, around 400 different samples of product as well. And we did an average of what that particle and, and, and our particle count was. And as you can see, we are orders of magnitude uh, improvement in where and how the industry uh, averages from a particle standpoint. So again, these are the things that we're looking at, at driving at, at the root cause of some of the manufacturing challenges that are taking place. The other element is proving the advanced aseptic manufacturing and sterility over time. So at the site in the early 2000s, what they had done was they actually built a microbial challenge facility. And they challenged the BFS process by filling the room with 10 to the 6 bacillus subtilis into the room. And then they ran media fills with all different conditions within the process, right? To really truly know and understand what are the processing parameters that you need to have in place to be able to produce sterile product even in those types of environments. We challenged the surface of the, the, the BFS machine and understand it where and what components actually need to be clean to run this. So again, in 10 to the 6 uh, bacillus settles challenges within the surface of the uh, you know, BFS, we challenged the different places to know and understand where along that process line do we have to make sure that we are maintaining and holding sterility. We also then did it with resin. So again, this is what drives those media studies is really what drives our critical control parameters that goes into how we run our manufacturing process. And this is the ways that we drive at making sure that there is sterile product day in and day out. So at the end of the day, when you look at it and really how you drive risk, a lot of the principles behind quality by design was actually embraced before quality by design was ever really talked about. 50 years ago when they designed this technology and they designed it in the elements of eliminating human uh, intervention, when they drove in the automation side of it, those were some of the ideas and the concepts on the, on the QBD side before it was ever talked about. Then you add in the elements of process understanding and, and, and product understanding and interaction and there's where we, we are able to drive out the risks associated with Blowfield Seal. Now, what you then are able to do, the other part of this is that we're also creating a new container closure. And those are some of the other things that you need to look at, right? There's opportunity in creating a new container closure. The opportunity to create something that is, it, it eliminates the idea of delamination, right? It tr takes away any of the cleaning and the glass management issues that you have on front. It also creates a durable material that provides weight advantages and actually provides some stability advantages as well when you're looking at it for large molecules. And it, it, it decreases some of the interactions that may potentially occur with the coatings that take place on the inside of glass. Right, so there's opportunity in creating, but there are also some of considerations that also need to be looked at. Glass is a great product. I mean, at the end of the day, it is impervious you know, to moisture transfer, to oxygen transfer. Plastics are semi-permeable membranes, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a semi-permeable material. So we need to know and understand what does that stability profile look like. Now, when you're really talking about large molecules, you also need to know what that stability looks like in, you know, at, at cold temperatures versus ambient versus, you know, an accelerated, right? So temperature is a huge impact on what that stability is going to look like. Leachables and extractables is another major concern, right? Not because of, you know, the, the amount that it is. It's, all, I mean, at the end of the day, all things have extractants, right? So glass has them as well. But they're known, they're understood, they're characterized, and people know how to control that, right? Going to something like this is just the unknown. So it's making sure that you have the data sets associated to help 
with the transition from somebody to go from glass to plastic. You know, and ultimately the, the last part is, is that you have thermal conditions. We are forming the container. It comes out of the extruder at 170 degrees C. So what does that do to a thermally sensitive product? And what are the ways that you need to look at it? And the balance of this presentation is really looking at that container closure and where and how that provides value to the market. So again, from a thermal standpoint, um, this is the one to address. Like I was stating before, that resin coming out of the machine is at about 170 degrees C. The heat transfer process associated is very efficient. The material itself will, the, the, the plastic will cool inside the body of the product in a matter of about two seconds. And it will really take on the, the temperature of the mold itself. And so our molds typically run around 70 degrees C. Because again, we got to be able to keep that balance of making something solid and still be able to have the ability to seal these products up. But what happens within the product is something else. So really, you can control the variables of what that incoming material is, so how we keep that product chilled. So again, the, the, the main factors is when that product is being filled, you're, you're, you have a very dynamic cooling space inside there. Because it's the, the, the temperature of the product that you're filling really has a, a, an impact on the overall temperature that the, the container will see. The other one is container design. So things like wall thickness and surface to volume ratios have a true impact of where and how you'll see. So, so as you can see from this example, the product temperature that really is, is seen on the overall basis, the cold temperature you can affect. So an uncontrolled environment, so if you're running at an ambient uh, you know, material, in a very small container with a large wall thickness, you're actually seeing about a 40 degree C peak is what that temperature will be. If we control and you do some of the cooling in the upfront with the same container designs, you're at about a 35 degree C. So now if we go and we do a larger fills and thinner walls, you can actually bring those temperatures down really close to where you are at, at a room temperature, really around that 23 to 27 degrees C. Uh, range is where you can get temperatures uh, to fill, which then allows us to do things uh, in the large molecule space. Permeation, you know, is really one of the drivers on the on this, uh, stability side. So really knowing and understanding what are the variables that you have with it. You know, again, this is another one where temperature has a major impact on where and how uh, how much you know, moisture transfer or oxygen transfer takes place. You know, again, we've done studies to show that you're really looking at probably about a four time difference between cold temperature products into where you would be at accelerated. So again, knowing the container size, wall thicknesses again, and, and container design is very important. Material of construction is another one that can drastically impact what your permeation properties are of that product. And again, we've taken and we've looked at this across a two-year shelf life, really leveraging the, the 10 ml container, really. And this is, this is where a lot of the data is, has been generated toward. Um, and you can see that's about a 1% uh, weight loss across a two-year shelf life. And an accelerated standpoint, really, you show it about the 1.4%. So again, that's, that's where we are from a weight loss standpoint at room temperature conditions or accelerated, as we see here. Again, from an extractable study, it's more along the lines of how do you actually run that extractable study? What do you look at? What are the variables in, in, in how you drive that? And ultimately, it's the generation of a library that really is then able to help the identification process as that leachable program and leachable studies is, is run. But I think ultimately, we talked about you know, these things in, in theory, but really, we need to put it into practical application. And this is where we have two years data. And we, we ran a, a case study. And we ran a case study on a model monoclonal antibody uh, that we produced. And what we really wanted to do was to show more data associated with large molecule processing in this technology. Now, we have 20 years of experience at the site producing a biologic product. So it's a commercial biologic widely used in the cystic fibrosis industry. 
Um, and, and so we, we inherently know systems and controls of what we can do to do uh, to, to make the product work and to make the technology work for these applications. Ultimately, what we're trying at this period of time is to show more definitive data of what this would look like. So we've gone through and we selected a you know, commercial monoclonal uh, antibody that's in the market, very similar in dose format and delivery uh, that you would have. So it's the 10 ml uh, you know, filled product and, and <clears throat> excuse me, things that we would have a reference for. And what we wanted to do is look at this from an experiment standpoint comparing it at time zero. So does the process itself embark any negativity onto the molecule? So we did it at a time zero study and looked at it in comparison from the bulk to the Advocep vial. And then after that was completed, we then took that bulk material and we filled it in glass. And then we ran side-by-side -side stability study over the course of two years. And this is the, the case study that we actually ran through. So ultimately, we leveraged the network within the Catalan you know, family to say, okay, well, what types of testing would we have to do? How would we look at it? So we leveraged our, our, our biologics experts, uh, you know, both from an analytical side and a manufacturing side. So our manufacturing site produced us a monoclonal antibody that we then went and filled in our Woodstock facility. And we generated really 16 tests is what we found to give us a good benchmark of what the technology looks like and how it would look. So across those 16 different tests, we then ran at that time zero study. And these results really showed no statistical difference between the bulk API and the filled product. So eliminating really the, the question, did the process do anything negative to that protein? We then took it to the next step. And so we did it as a, a series of progressions and we pulled samples out. We stored the product under you know, uh, storage conditions that the molecule would typically see, so at the five degrees C. And we did that in a comparison to the glass. And we looked at everything from, you know, its, its ability, you know, to still kill uh, cells. So we looked at its activity levels, right? And we looked at that over time. And again, you can see our activity levels were showing between the Advocept and the glass vial as, as very comparative. From a, from a, you know, a sample of, of the, you know, the gene expression, you can see that lane two is the glass vial, lane three is our Advocep vial, and those again marry up very well at, from a comparable standpoint. And as you can see, our SEC UV aggregation study, you know, again, maps and marries, you know, over time of this two-year shelf life that the product can contribute and, and contributes positively, um, you know, to, the, to, to really showing that this technology is comparable uh, in both glass and Advocep. And ultimately, we looked at leachables. You know, again, leachables are going to be different from ICH, you know, thresholds. You know, we showed that, you know, the leachables that we have within the products are safe, you know, for, uh, for handling. So ultimately, you know, the, from, from an industry standpoint, leveraging this technology and where and how it can fit to really drive out a lot of the risks associated with aseptic manufacturing, this is where this technology can offer that glass-free injectable platform to be able to provide uh, you know, the next generation of injectable products. So again, I'd, I'd appreciate everyone for taking the time to, you know, to come and listen, and, and at this time, I'd, I'd welcome any questions. All right, I guess that handled it. I, you know, we do, you know, so if you, you know, later this afternoon, uh, you know, we do have a reception at the Catalan booths, so there will be, you know, uh, cocktails and, you know, uh, some appetizers there. Be happy to, to answer or talk about any of the uh, questions that you may have. So thank you again for the attention. Enjoy the rest of the day.